Dear beloved Sangha, it's so wonderful to be together with everyone again. It's hard to believe it's been just a month. It feels uh, like it was a lot longer. There's been so many things that have been happening. I had to smile uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of our practitioners said, Brother Fapai, I was amazed that you were able to give a talk, um, even though you had COVID. And I smiled and didn't say anything. But then a conspiracy theory started to emerge. Um, and we all know there are some dark corners of the uh, of YouTube. Um, there are some dark corners, perhaps, of the of the internet and the human mind. But uh, there was a conspiracy theory that emerged that uh, people were uh, a couple of friends were saying. But it was light outside. There was kind of light coming in and shining on your face in the video um, when you were giving the talk and these kind of things. The whole seemed very light. And um, so I had to confess that it is true. Um, the talk uh, was not live uh, last last month. It was actually um, uh, pre-recorded. And um, uh, I was uh, traveling to Nyaplu Monastery down in Victoria at the time. So I pre-recorded the talk um, just in case I wouldn't be able to give the talk um, live due to the, the internet issues. And then um, I contracted COVID. So it was a very good thing that the talk was recorded. So um, in this one very specific situation, the conspiracy theory was correct. The, the, the talk was pre-recorded. Um, this one is not. I don't have a newspaper to hold up to <laughs> show with today's date or time, but uh, this is this is recorded live. So friends who have listened to my Dharma talks in the past will know that there are times when giving a Dharma talk on a particular text, I might begin by sharing a story or share a few seemingly unrelated items. I remember a while back, a very helpful friend posted a comment under one of the videos on YouTube saying something like the talk on the text actually begins at the 21 minute mark. You're welcome. And this is our usual tendency to think that there's a main point and that everything else is secondary and can be discarded. In fact, each moment of the talk is the key point. And this is also, to me, one of the key insights of engaged Buddhism and the reason why the practice of engaged Buddhism is so transformative. Each moment of our lives, even the most insignificant are the main points. Mindfulness is applied to each moment of our lives. Each moment of our lives is a moment to wake up, a moment to return home, to claim our real inheritance. In a famous Chinese Zen poem called Faith in Mind, Xin Xing Ming, there's a line that speaks to this. If only you don't aim, you can't miss. This doesn't mean just to kick back and to do nothing, but rather it means to see every moment of our lives as the ultimate. With this understanding, there's not the idea of let me do my practice and then get back to my everyday life. Or once I get finished with this, whatever it might be, paperwork, cooking, cleaning, then I'll be able to practice. If we've got this idea, then we're a practitioner of the small vehicle. The small vehicle here has very little to do with a particular lineage, but rather refers to a tendency to compartmentalize, to see spiritual practice in a reductive way, please, as good students of the Buddha, as good students of Tay, please let go of the idea that you need to be somewhere else doing something else in order to engage in real practice. From my heart to yours, the truth is that you'll never get there if you think that it's somewhere other than where you are right now. And this is somewhat of a hard truth to embrace. But this is really, to me, 
the heart of engaged Buddhism. Engaged Buddhism when it becomes real. As we come to the second chapter of the Lotus Sutra, we come to a chapter that many scholars tell us is one of the key chapters of the text. It's indeed a very important one, but as we walk through the Lotus Sutra, even the seemingly insignificant or those chapters or sections that seem to be filler chapters or throwaway sections are deeply important. To be honest, this talk has been quite a challenging one to prepare for, perhaps one of the most challenging um, in my uh, monastic career or my time as a Dharma teacher. Since there's so much to share about in the second chapter, it's quite tempting just to focus on one or two points. And in the end, I've decided to bring out a number, not all of the key themes and teachings in the second chapter. I'm doing this because I want to share with you some of the brilliance of the Lotus Sutra and for us to touch some of the richness that's there, hopefully sparking an interest and an enthusiasm in you to continue your exploration and reflection. So this is why I wanted to share about a number of the key issues, the key points, the key insights of the second chapter. The vastness of the material in the second chapter can be quite overwhelming. And after some consideration, what I've decided to do is to offer a bird's eye view of some of the main themes of this chapter without delving in too deeply on into any one of those topics. We might discover in this why some people end up devoting their lives to the study and practice of this beautiful text. There are those who've devoted their lives to just one of the many teachings that are offered in this chapter alone. There's that amount of richness. So when we look at the text, when we take a moment to reflect where we are in the text, up until now, in contrast to most sutras, the Buddha himself has not spoken. Rather, he's been immersed in meditation and contemplation. Many of you may recall what I shared about in the last uh, Dharma talk uh, on this sutra about the Lotus Sutra's tendency to flip our assumptions on their head. Most of the Buddhist sutras begin with a question from the audience. The Lotus Sutra begins with wondrous occurrences that surprise everyone who's gathered on Vulture Peak. There's a radiance emerging from the Buddha. The world shakes in six ways. This is a deeply symbolic moment. Everything that we thought was solid is now movable. Everything, including our views, especially our views, are shaking. This is a sign of what's to come with the preaching, the offering of the Lotus Sutra. The radiance emerging from the Buddha is illuminating all the various realms in which we see Buddha's teaching, even now, in this very instant. This is, as we've shared before, already mind-blowing, a seemingly impossible occurrence, an impossible thought up until now. It's only in this second chapter of the Lotus Sutra that the Buddha begins to spontaneously speak. There's something to note here, and that is that we can see this as a reminder that in contrast to most teachings, most teachings, most sutras in which the Buddha adapted his teaching to fit the understanding of the listeners, here he's speaking directly from his own insight. The Buddha begins to speak 
However, he doesn't speak to Manjushri or Maitreya, who have been the key people, the key bodhisattvas who've spoken up to now. This is something that we would expect. And he also doesn't address any of the other celestial bodhisattvas or uh, amazing beings that have gathered, the four great kings and so on. Rather, he speaks to Shariputra. Each person has different tendencies and capabilities in terms of meditation or spiritual practice. Not everyone is going to develop in exactly the same way. Many of the early disciples of the Buddha were considered to be the foremost or the best in certain things. Shariputra was considered to be the foremost in wisdom. And because Shariputra was an arhat, the primary difference between an arhat and the Buddha being that an arhat is liberated based upon the Buddha's teaching. And then up to then, there would not seem there would not have seemed to have been any significant difference between the wisdom of the Buddha and the wisdom wisdom of an arhat. Up until then, in uh, Buddhist thought, there was not seen to be any significant difference between the inside of an arhat and the inside of a Buddha. The only difference, as I just shared, being that an arhat awakens based on the Buddha's teachings. But even with that framework, in contrast to some other Mahayana works, there's a spirit of reconciliation in the Lotus Sutra. In some texts like the Vimalakirti Sutra, Shariputra is presented as the personification of all the shortcomings of the so-called traditionalist or conservative or monastic only approach. Here in the Lotus Sutra, in a way, Shariputra stands in for all of us in the same way that if we reflect deeply, Shariputra is standing in for us in the Heart Sutra. The Buddha praises the wisdom of the Buddhas when he begins to speak. And he says that the wisdom of the Buddhas is vaster than Shravakas and Pracheka Buddhas. Shravaka's hearers, this means stream enterers, once returners, arhats, and so on. All the fruits of the path that the Buddha had spoken about up until now. So basically, in this sentence, in this sharing of the Buddha, the Buddha is saying that uh, all of you who have attained fruits on the path so far, who've listened to my teachings, no matter how advanced you are, your wisdom is nothing compared to the wisdom of the Buddhas. And we have uh, those uh, other beings there that are called Pracheka Buddhas, and they are uh, considered to be those who haven't had contact with the Buddha's teachings. They haven't met a Buddha in person, they haven't um, come into contact with any form of the Buddha's teachings, but they they awaken uh, to the, the same insights as the Buddha. And at the same time, they don't teach. The Buddha shares with us that he has taught the Dharma through skillful means, upaya, and that all Buddhas have attained mastery of this quality of skillful means the quality of wisdom, and the quality of insight. If you visit a traditionally designed monastery, like our root temple, Du Hiu in Hue, at the entrance of the monastery, you'll see a triple gate. You sometimes need to pass through a triple, uh, the triple gate. Usually the center, the central portal is closed, there'll be a, a, a kind of a gate there since we normally only open uh, that gate when there's a big ceremony. But many of us have seen the triple, uh, triple gate of a monastery. These three entrances can symbolize many things. But for now, I'm going to offer one framework that seems appropriate at this moment. 
The first gateway is called the gateway of wisdom. In Chinese, wisdom, zhihui, or in Vietnamese, tri tuệ, is made up of two characters, zhi, which means wisdom, and hui, which means insight. Wisdom is made up of these two qualities, knowledge and insight. They need to be combined in order to manifest wisdom. In one sense, knowledge is information. It needs to be applied in our daily life in order to generate the wisdom that transforms. The second gateway is called the gateway of compassion. Compassion is in Chinese, it's zhipei. In Vietnamese, tu bi. And it's made up of two characters, zi or tu, which literally means loving kindness, and bei or bi, which means compassion. Wisdom and compassion are considered in Mahayana Buddhism to be the two wings of a bird. Wisdom without compassion is dry and analytical and cold. Compassion without wisdom is unbalanced. The third gateway in a triple gate is the gateway that manifests when wisdom and compassion are combined. The mindful child that emerges when wisdom and compassion unite is called the gateway of skillful means, or in Chinese, fang bian, or fung tin in Vietnamese. Fang means straight, and bian means convenience. Perhaps we could consider it as cutting right to the chase, to the essence, in a way that's appropriate and useful to the person, the situation, and the capacity. Returning to the text itself, after his introductory remarks, the Buddha says, enough Shariputra. I'm not going to say any more, since no one except a Buddha, together with a Buddha, would be able to understand the character, the nature, the substance, the potential, the function, the cause, the condition, the result, the effect, and the essential unity. This is quite an astounding statement for so many reasons, and we'll be returning to a few other aspects of it in a moment. But first I'll share that this is another example of an inversion, since tradition tells us that in teaching Shariputra the Abhidhamma, the Buddha taught Shariputra in detail, precisely on these points. But now the Buddha is saying that only a Buddha together with a Buddha can deeply understand these things. What does it mean, a Buddha together with a Buddha? Up until now, as we shared in the previous talk, there was the view that there could only be one Buddha existing in the, get ready for it, entire 3,000 great thousand fold world system at a time. In the Lotus, we're taught that there are Buddhas everywhere right in this moment. You know, I'm really tempted to give a little workshop on Buddhist cosmology and all of the various mythical beings and things like the 3000 great thousand fold world system. But for now, I'll just mention something that I've always found very helpful when I walk or when I sit. There's an understanding that the whole world system, I don't want to say universe, because in Buddhist thinking, a world system is much more vast and intricate than just a universe. A universe is just one aspect of a world system. The world system or many world systems that are in different uh, states at this moment, go through a process of coming to be and a process of destruction over great lengths of time. Since this process has been going on since limitless time and there have been so many Buddhas and awakened ones, there's a teaching in the secret school of Buddhism that every single place that we step, 
every single place that we sit is a place in which at one time someone has awakened. When I touch into that insight, into that vision, then there's a deep sense of connection and sacredness that emerges. It's a very beautiful way to practice walking meditation, to practice sitting meditation. There are some people who think uh, the little verses for practice that Tay offered us are so simple or even simplistic, but many times they are pointing to these um, insights, this kind of understanding. Um, for example, sitting here is like sitting under the Bodhi tree. It's the first part of the, the verse that we recite when we sit down anywhere. And so when we recite that verse, sitting here is like sitting under the Bodhi tree, we can tap into this energy, this understanding that uh, the very place that we sit at some point, somebody has woken up. And if we understand things to be outside of space and time, and that the future and the past all exist at once, that person may be you. I hope it is. If that's too mystical for you, then you can touch into aspects of it by reflecting on all of the living beings who've been in the place where you are. All of the experiences that have taken place on that piece of earth that you might know nothing about, but that the earth has held. Let's enjoy a sound of the bell. Shariputra hearing this and seeing that there's a bit of a rustle and a confusion in the crowd and with everyone thinking along the lines of how come the Buddha is talking about skillful means? What does he mean by saying that everything that he taught up until now is just a method for us to be able to accept the real truth, which now he's offering us? We've been practicing what the Buddha taught and where our hearts and so on we've awakened we've done what had to be done which is the traditional phrase when somebody's completed their journey of awakening why is the buddha now saying that to quote the carpenters you've only just begun shariputra seeing this then asks the buddha three times to teach everybody saying world honored one what is the reason that you're now emphasizing this teaching on skillful means and praising it so highly. I've never heard such a teaching from you before. And the Buddha refuses saying that it would be too perplexing, too confusing, um, un destabilizing for everyone. In Buddhist practice, for important things, we always ask three times. This shows our seriousness. So if you come to a teacher and you request a teaching and then the teacher says, no, uh, it's not the right time, don't give up. If you haven't asked three times, then you, know, you haven't really shown your sincerity. Um, so maybe we give up too quickly. The teacher will say no the first time. We're like, oh, well, Tefa Pai didn't want to talk about that. <sighs> um, or, uh, uh, Brother Fapnim or Sister Gina, Sister Annabelle doesn't want to talk about that. Ask a couple more times. You might be surprised. So finally, after Shariputra's insistence, the Buddha agrees to teach. If we've been contemplating the Sutra up to now, seeing the auspicious signs and the fact that the, the, the Buddha had emitted all of these auspicious signs. Actually, the fact that 
the Buddha was going to teach the lotus was already certain. When the Buddha declares his intention to teach, something surprising happens. 5,000 students of the Buddha, monks, nuns, laymen and laywomen, were so shocked and disappointed by the Buddha's words to the effect that there's a deeper teaching that they hadn't understood up until now, that the Buddha hadn't shared with them up until now. And that they had not in fact realized the fruit of the path. They got so upset and disappointed that they stand up and they walk out. A good teacher is a person or a situation, as I've shared before, that challenges us in some way and causes us to expand our mind and our heart. If the teacher is just confirming everything that we already think we know, we haven't really learned anything. We haven't grown in any way. So let's return to this somewhat enigmatic phase, a Buddha together with a Buddha, or only a Buddha together with a Buddha can penetrate the ultimate reality of all things. It's easy to interpret this in kind of a, a, a way that, uh, that we, the, only the Buddha can understand this and that humans, you know, for example, could never understand this or I know this, but you will, you don't get it. But the Buddha doesn't say only a Buddha can understand. He says, only a Buddha together with a Buddha. And this is a reminder of one of the key themes of this text. Wisdom and insight is not the purview of one person. No single viewpoint in isolation can ever encompass the ultimate reality of all things. There's always more to discover. Our journey is endless. And at the same time, everything's already been done. In the context of the Lotus Sutra, the key theme is this teaching that we'll be exploring called the One Buddha Vehicle, that everyone will become a Buddha and in some sense is already a Buddha. Or as Tay says, part-time Buddhas. Given this emphasis in the Lotus Sutra, as well as the Lotus Sutra's capacity for being a mirror. One interpretation of this sentence can be that the Buddha is talking to us, the interaction between us and the Buddha. He's offering us his body in the form of a teaching. So the interaction between us and the teaching. The Buddha continues on from this phrase by outlining something that's very important. Goodness, it seems that there are so many things in this chapter that I'm marking in the very important column, putting in the make note of this for the pop quiz column. And that's something called the 10 suchnesses or the 10 tatatas. Yeah, you're right. This is the same root as the word tatagata, the one that comes from suchness. The full paragraph reads in the text, that's enough Shariputra, I will say no more. Why? Because the Dharma that the Buddhas have attained is understood only rarely and with great difficulty. Only a Buddha together with a Buddha can completely penetrate the ultimate reality of all things. That is to say among all things, and this here is all Dharmas, Dharma with a small d, any phenomena. Among all things, this has such an appearance. It has such a nature. It has such an embodiment, such a potential, such a function, such a cause, such a condition, such an effect, such a reward, and such a fundamental coherence or fundamental unity all the way through. 
I want to mention something here, and it's probably a little bit more relevant to the sutra nerds in the room. These 10 factors don't appear in any existing version of the Sanskrit text of the Lotus Sutra that we've come across up to this point. This is a bit of a plot twist. In the existing versions of the Sanskrit text, as well as Dharma Raksha's translation, there are only five factors listed here. Kumara Jiva's translation, as we've learned before, is the basis of the most popular versions of the Lotus Sutra in East Asia and also in English. And it is not always a direct translation of the Sanskrit. Kumara Jiva expands some sections in a way that helps us to be able to understand them more deeply. Just as a number of times our teacher Tay did the same thing with some of the, the texts, the sutras in the Plum Village chanting book, for example. He, rather than translating extremely precisely just word by word, sometimes he would explain it in a way that would encapsulate the, the essence of what the Buddha was, was teaching. And this section of the Ten Suchnesses is, is such an example. There's a lot of discussion, as one might imagine, as to the reason why Kumara Jiva apparently expanded the five dharmas into the ten suchnesses. There are a few suggestions, but the one that resonates the most with me is the fact that in the year 405, Kumara Jiva completed his translation of the Mahaprajna Paramita commentary the commentary on the great perfection of wisdom. And he translated the Lotus Sutra about three years later in the year 408. It's thought that in, in possibly expanding the text a little at this point, Shara, uh, Kumara Jiva referred to the teaching in the Mahaprajna Paramita Shastra. However, we must always hold open the possibility that Kumara Jiva was relying on an as yet undiscovered Sanskrit version of the Lotus Sutra. And this possibility is not so far fetched since we're discovering additional texts or version of versions of texts quite often. In any case, these 10 suchnesses are of such importance in uh, uh, Tentai Buddhism that I wanted to share a little bit about them in this talk and in a way they're very much a Mahayana version in my view of dependent co-arising. The ten suchnesses are a very important framework in Tentai Buddhism. These suchnesses are a lifelong journey of discovery and I'll just pass through them in a simple way. Basically, for every single thing that arises, whether physically or emotionally or mentally, um, then there are these factors. The first is form. It's kind of the appearance or the outer appearance, the attributes perhaps, of something that are discernible, like color, shape, behavior, and so on. Everything has its characteristic form. For example, a rose bush will offer certain kinds of blossoms. That's the particular form, its natural aspect. And this is what is meant by such a form or such an appearance. The next factor is nature, which is the inherent quality of a person or a thing that can't necessarily be seen just from the outward appearance. If a being or a Dharma had its own characteristic external form, also each thing, each form, each being has its own particular nature, one that is in keeping with its form. Some roses have the nature, for example, of bearing red blossoms or pink blossoms 
here in Mountain Spring, we have a lot of pink roses. And this year they have been very happy and they've offered out pink roses that are almost as big as cabbages um, all over the monastery. It's been quite beautiful. Some have white flowers. The forms and the colors of the blossoms accord with the nature, the characteristic of the, of the plant. So this is what is meant by such a nature. It's a rose, um, a rose bush, but then it has each rose bush within uh, the kind of certain appearance, the certain manifestation has some characteristics that are going to develop. Then there's the next factor, which is embodiment. And this is, in a sense, the combination or maybe the culmination of the first two factors. A being that has its own form and its own nature also has its own embodiment. This is not some kind of special attribute that remains unchanged eternally or exists autonomously without any relation to anything else. It's simply the thing itself called such an embodiment or such a substance. The above three suchnesses describe what is called in Tentai philosophy, the fundamental reality of life itself. And the next six from the fourth through to the ninth explain the functions and the workings of life. So the next is potency or potential. Everything that is embodied also has its abilities. And these capabilities are referred to as such a potential. A being possessed of an embodiment always has some degree of potential that's appropriate to that particular form. A seed of corn contains the potential to grow into corn, it does not, at least in the historical dimension, have the capacity to grow into roses. This is what is meant by such a potential or such a potency. When I was reflecting on this factor, I was reflecting on some of my own potentials. And I know I have some small, very limited potentials in some areas and absolutely none in others. I remember we were, the brothers in Upper Hamlet were playing uh, soccer together uh, one time. This is many years ago now. I was in my early 20s. And as we were playing soccer, one of the other brothers, I won't tell you his name, uh, <laughs> but uh, he ordained a, about a year, year and a half um, before me. Uh, he said, Brother Fabai, you only have the capacity to bring water and oranges to those of us who can play. <laughs> so so uh, all of us have our own particular potentials and potencies. Soccer is definitely not one of mine. Um, function or sometimes influence. Potency or potential invariably give rise to some degree of activity or function even if it's not fully developed. The power, the energy that's kind of latent within the seed of corn, it absorbs conditions from around itself like water, warmth of the sun and so on, the nutrients from the soil and it swells and then the skin is broken and it begins to sprout and it causes the sprout to push through the soil and emerge above the ground. And this is a function of the potency of the seed of corn naturally manifesting itself. And it's ex an example of this um, suchness of each thing has such a function or such an influence. So up until this point, we've been reflecting on the essence and workings of seemingly individual existing things. There are countless phenomena in this universe of ours. Nothing in the world exists entirely of and by itself. Everything interpenetrates. 
and when everything interpenetrates there are uh, so many additional phenomena that are created and all of these creations and destructions and combinations take place in accordance with a particular law that we'll examine next and that's called the primary or internal cause phenomena which is everything that arises always has a cause this kind of seems so obvious that it almost seems kind of superfluous to say anything extra, right? Everything has a cause. However, as good Buddhist scholars, <laughs> of course, will know that a lot of commentary, some of it quite interesting and engaging, has been written on this point. The universe is filled with phenomena. And each of these things are deeply interrelated because all of the outward directed functionings of each embodiment mutually interact with one another. There's no isolated existence without relation to other things. This is one important aspect of what Tay has been speaking about. Tay offered us in his insight of interbeing. That with this manifestation of functioning, then it interacts with all other phenomena. And this mutual interaction produces additional phenomena, something that is primarily responsible for the production of such a phenomenon is called such a cause. And then there's also the secondary cause or sometime the condition. And secondary causes are various conditions like internal and external that help the primary or support the primary internal cause producing an effect. So even when a, a potential cause is present, it's not going to produce its effect unless it comes into contact with certain conditions. For example, the grain of corn needs certain conditions to be activated. These circumstances or conditions or, or occasions that act as a secondary cause they're called such a condition. If, however, a given cause is not accompanied by the appropriate conditions or opportunities, then it's not going to produce an effect. It's just going to be dormant. It will stop there. And then there's something called the latent effect, which is, I guess you could say it's the dormant effect produced when a primary cause, such a cause, meets with the proper circumstances, such a condition. It's, and then it produces a phenomenon, a result, which we call such an effect. And then there's the reward or recompense, the payment, and which is like the tangible, perceivable effect that emerges in time as an expression of a dormant effect. And therefore, in a way, it's a potential cause in and of itself. Again, through all of the related and connected conditions. It's not simply a matter of a certain effect being realized and then that's the end of the process, done and dusted, cause, effect, you're done. It's a whole process without a beginning and also without an end, an effect always results in something later on. By the way, an effect is not realized just as an immediate here and now only phenomenon. It invariably has an influence that lingers, that continues on like a trace or a residue. This is what is meant by such a reward or such a recompense, this lingering effect that continues on. 
Then finally, just kidding. Of course, even though there are 10 factors, if we consider this next factor to be the last one, then we've misunderstood entirely. From 10, we move back to one. The 10th factor is complete fundamental whole, consistency or unity from beginning to the end. The factor complete fundamental whole or complete unity means that the other nine factors from form to recompense are consistently equal and interrelated. The 10 suchnesses indicate that all of these 10 factors are the truth and they're equal in any aspect. Every single thing that comes to be comes to be through presenting all of the first nine suchnesses from appearance through reward or recompense. That's to say from the first such an appearance to the last such a reward. These nine suchnesses are inseparable and they're ultimately equal because they actually comprise what we call the phenomenon. The ultimate integration, the oneness of the above nine suchnesses is understood as the tenth and the final suchness. From the first to the last of these ten, such an ultimate equality. The manner, the way in which all things, including human beings, manifest their existence and relate to each other as a function of this principle of the ten suchnesses is called the ultimate reality of all things. And it's what the Buddha was referring to in this section when he spoke about the ultimate reality of all things. Let's take a moment to enjoy a sound of the bell, to come back to our breathing, to come back to our bodies, to come back to this moment. Sangha, I have been sharing for uh, close to an hour now, 50 minutes, and we haven't actually gotten to the main point, if we want to look at it that way, the, the core teaching of the second chapter yet. We're just, we've just been sharing about the first few introductory paragraphs. There is so much here, such a richness, and even this one teaching of the 10 suchnesses is a teaching that if we apply it as a lens of insight and a lens of practice can uh, uh, be something that will carry us and, and deepen for the whole of our life. I'm tempted to stop here since the next thing that emerges and goes together with the insight of the 10 suchnesses is uh, something called the 10 worlds. Ah, it's all for fun. Let's continue for a little while longer. In our last talk, we spoke a little about the great 6th century Dentai Master, Master Zhi Yi. The 10 suchnesses are what led the great Master Zhi Yi to realize and to offer the teaching of the, the 3000 worlds in one thought. This is a very famous phrase in Chinese Buddhism and especially in Tiantai Buddhism. Um, 3,000 worlds in one thought moment. As I shared 
maybe later on we might have a little fun workshop on cosmology but for now we'll pass through very simply the 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 understanding of the ten realms the tentai school describes ten dharma realms of sentient beings the hell realms the hungry ghosts animals asuras humans divine beings or devas shravakas pracheka buddhas bodhisattvas and buddhas up until now in a, a very general form uh, Buddhist thought up until this moment had been sharing about the nine abodes of beings, but in the Lotus Sutra, a tenth is added. In Chinese Buddhism itself, there's a, a saying, ten Dharma realms in a single moment. All of these Dharma realms are available right here and right now. We're living in them to various degrees right here and right now. According to Master Ji Yi, each of these 10 Dharma realms mutually includes all of the other realms. And it results in a hundred states of existence that each share the characteristics of the 10 suchnesses. Let's look at that again. Each of these 10 Dharma realms mutually includes all the other realms, which results in 10 Oh, sorry, in a hundred states of existence. And each of those states of existence share the characteristics of the 10 suchnesses. For example, in the human realm, there are also all the other realms. So to use an example, you might be a human, but in contact with the hell realms, currently engaging with such a reward or such a recompense. You might be a human in contact with the divine realm who's currently experiencing such an influence. So that's a thousand possibilities in a moment already. But of course, you know, we're not done yet. These 1000 suchnesses are active in each of what are called the three spheres. The five skandhas sentient beings and their environments, which all together form what's called the 3000 worlds in one thought moment. A number of teachers have considered the teaching of 3000 worlds in one thought as the fundamental principle of the Lotus Sutra and by extension, the very essence of the Buddha's teachings. The suchnesses reveal the deepest reality, which is in inherent within all things. And consequently, in, in, it illuminates the fact that every single thing in the universe is interrelated with all things. The suchnesses one through nine operate according to the law of the universal truth, which is the final suchness, namely from the complete fundamental whole or unity of all things, all things, including human beings, along with our connections, our relations, our interrelation with everything that is, is formed from the reality of all existence that's the 10 suchnesses. Those of you who are familiar with the Kabbalah will be familiar with the teaching of the 10 emanations or Sephiro on the tree of life in the different levels of the tree of life. And we can't help, or at least I can't help, but see a similarity here in its uh, form, also in its intricacy. The Ten Realms is part of the Buddhist cosmology that provides us a glimpse of the homes in which all beings dwell. These are seen as existing realms, but also within the mind, or perhaps 
dependent upon mind. Mind and phenomena are the same thing. The ten realms have two aspects, external and internal. External means it's an environment in which living beings can live in. While internal means it's the life condition for people experiencing varying thoughts and emotions at any given moment. Most of the Buddha's teachings have some connection with the Ten Realms. And so I thought it'd be helpful to understand just in a basic sense about the quality of existence, the kind of existence, the kind of experience one has with, which, with each of these Ten Realms. a lot of detailed information about the Ten Realms and uh, even more intricate forms of this kind of cosmology, both a kind of external cosmology and a cosmology of our own consciousness, which is called the 31 planes of existence, in particular are found in the Pali Canon, such as the Majjhima Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Digha Nikaya, Kudaka Nikaya, and so on. So the ten realms comprise of six lower worlds and four higher worlds. The six lower worlds, the six lower realms are kind of from the, the highest to the lowest, the heavenly realms, the human realms, the asuras, the animals, the hungry ghosts, the hell, realm, the hell realms. And then the four higher worlds, the four noble states are Buddhahood, Bodhisattvahood, Pracheka Buddhahood, and Shravakahood, the, the, those that have attained the fruits of the path. So as opposed to emphasizing the external aspects of cosmology, Gentile philosophy focuses on the application of the ten realms in our daily life, teaching us how to recognize and transform suffering into happiness. The essence of this understanding of the ten realms is this. Every realm contains within it all the other nine. And this means that Buddhahood is inseparable from the other nine states. The concepts that we spoke about before that are integral to our understanding of the Lotus Sutra, like this idea of 3000 realms in a single moment of life, are all derivations of the 10 worlds. It's understood in Buddhism that our inner state and also our choices and our actions manifest an environment around ourselves. A Buddha, for example, manifests a Buddha field, both physically and also just in terms of an energy around themselves. It can be helpful to see these 10 realms as collective and also individual manifestations. I always find it interesting when somebody comes to the monastery for a retreat or for a day of mindfulness, and at the end of their stay, they'll say something like, well, it's time to go back to the real world. And I always find this fascinating because I ask myself, who decided that the way that we live in our daily life um, in society is the real world. And why are we in the monastery living in an unreal world? Um, people say, oh, I have to get back to reality. As if um, here in the monastery, we're not in contact with reality. The teaching of the Lotus Sutra is that both of these, these worlds are interdependently existing and they're both equally real for the people that buy into them, the people that choose to live in them. To live in the environment of a monastery, it's an individual and a collective creation. 
um, it's a, I guess you could say it's an emanation of a, a, a collective and individual aspiration. It's as real as we want it to be. It's also as fake as we want it to be. And it's completely unreal for the people that live in a different reality, that are diff living in a different realm. So that even that simple or even simplistic example of the comparison that's made between the environment of a practice center and uh, reality, uh, real life or the real world, like outside, we can see how they are interrelated. We're sharing often even kind of crossing over in the, the, the same space. Um, so this is the understanding of how uh, in, a, in a way of how the 10 realms all mutually inter are. So they're not um, divided from one another as different levels. They're all different ways of experiencing uh, existence. So we might just share a couple of the, the realms so that we can have a sense and then we'll, we'll see where we are. There's the hell realm and the world of hell or Naraka in Sanskrit is the world of suffering. There's a lot of very interesting literature on Buddhist hells. They're very descriptive. Um, there are quite a number of, of Buddhist hells. There's one uh, hell, for example, where like in the cosmology, it's described as that in that hell, there's a, 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 a burning, um, piece of metal and you know everybody has to huddle around this metal or there's freezing caves there's all of these fantastical stories but in general um it's they're very powerful metaphors for experiences or feelings that we can have people who dwell in this state of suffering are tormented by emotional and physical pain of depression of grief the very first discourse of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths, is the teaching on suffering. If we don't turn towards our suffering and look into the causes of our suffering, then happiness is a delusion. It's really unstable. It's not based on anything. And the Buddha, of course, identifies three key sources of our suffering. The three poisons in our mind our greed, our hatred of self and others, the closing down of our heart and our inability to see clearly. Sometimes it's translated as delusion. And according to Buddhist cosmology, there are 18 aspects of hell, each of which is not permanent. The hell realm is seen as a place for purifying unwholesome karma. So in a way, um, with that understanding in Buddhism, when we're going through some suffering, we're going through some difficulty, there is a sense of uh, not beating ourselves up too badly about it, but in a way, celebrating suffering. Now there's a fine line between celebrating and welcoming the suffering because it shows that transformation is happening. The fine line between that and uh, wallowing in it so as practitioners, we don't want to wallow in our suffering, but when sufferings are rising, rather than resisting it, rather than pushing it away, wanting anything but that, there's this, especially in the, um, this teaching, there's this energy of understanding that at this moment in time, we're going through this process, this process that's almost like a cleansing process of our mind and of our heart, and that if we look into it deeply, wisdom and understanding can arise from there. The next realm that we'll speak about is the realm of hungry ghosts. And the realm of hungry ghosts is also known as the kind of a state of hunger. And people or beings experiencing this state have this energy of never being satisfied or always grasping this sense of desperation in imagery the beings experiencing this state are shown as having very large stomachs but extremely small mouths like a pinprick 
This shows us how they have a great need, but that need can never be satisfied. We've all been in situations where we felt incredibly needy, we felt incredibly lonely. We've been grasping and thrashing around for something to nourish us, something that we think is outside of ourselves. We think that's going to heal our situation. And this is, in a very real sense, the realm of the hungry ghost. The truth is that whatever we're looking for can only ever be found in our own mind. Nothing from outside is ever going to fill that need, whether it's another person, whether it's an object. Quite a helpful reminder as we come to the holiday season, <laughs> whether it's some external condition also. In the Dhammapada, which is one of the most ancient teachings of the Buddha, in the very first verse, it tells us that the mind is the forerunner of all states and that everything comes from our mind alone. So dear Sangha, I would like to bring the talk to a close here. I am tempted to continue through these 10 realms, but we're only about halfway through the things that I've chosen to speak about this evening. And so uh, this will be the Lotus Sutra chapter two, part one. Um, and what I'd like to invite everyone to do is as we go through the next weeks, uh, reflecting on the two or on this part of chapter two, I'd like to invite you to consider just notice when different realms make themselves known to you, uh, whether in your own mind or around just that example of um, how we can have the real world and the unreal world. And for us here in the monastery, what what uh, people in society call the real world, it doesn't seem real to us. Um, we've chosen to live a different way. Just notice how uh, those those manifest. And notice the connections, the interrelations between them. I uh, wish everybody a wonderful few weeks of practice and we'll look forward to continuing this talk. I hope nobody's been scared away. I hope this has rather um, sparked an interest and an enthusiasm and just a sense of how rich and how deep the Lotus Sutra is. Let's finish with the sound of the bell. <laughs>